p.m. on ET now. GST groups continue in one of the most telling signs that all is not well. Only 40 lakh businesses out of the 93 lakh registered on the GST file their returns. As of today, the government talks stuff says there will be no further extension to the deadline which expires midnight. Finance Minister Arun Jaitley hard sells the India story to corporate America, highlights the Modi government's FDI push against the backdrop of rising protectionism, Tom Tom's the GST, and also makes a case for overhauling direct taxes next, even as the DA Secretary Subhash Chandra Garg admits that the Indian currency may be a tad too strong for comfort. The IMF, though, cuts India's uh, growth forecast for FY18 to 6.7% from the earlier 7.2%, citing aftershocks of demortization and GST. But it remains optimistic about the long-term impact of these big-ticket reforms and says India is well poised to grow at over 8% in the medium term. A major relief for consumers, taking a cue from Prime Minister Modi himself, Gujarat and Maharashtra slash value-added tax on petrol and diesel, effective midnight. The move coupled with last two weeks, two-rupee cut in excise duty will bring down the fuel bills for sure. But the Gujarat government alone is expected to take a revenue hit of over 2,300 crore rupees. The cracker crackdown continues just a day after the Supreme Court puts curbs on sale of firecrackers in the Delhi NCR region. The Bombay High Court bans the sale of firecrackers in residential areas in and around the city. Environment Minister Ramdas Kadam, however, wants now a blanket ban. It's an all-out political war as the Delhi Metro Corporation hikes fares for the second time in five months. Commuters set to shell out. An extra 10 rupees for every journey beyond 5 kilometers. Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal calls the fare hike unjustified. But viewers do need to know that fares did not go up for as long as 8 years since 2009. And it's an all-out war in battleground Gujarat. BJP President Amit Shah dredges up the poor state of affairs in the Congress family's own constituencies. Even as Rahul Gandhi slams the BJP's male-dominated ideological parent RSS as a sign of its inherent patriarchy. And after slashing mobile termination charges, telecom regulator TRAI sets its sights on overseas call tariffs and international roaming charges, set to chair a review meeting with all stakeholders on the 16th of this month to bring tariffs down to global standards. Hello and welcome to the India Development Debate. 100 days since India ushered in its biggest tax reform, the goods and services tax. Tonight is a good time to pause, reflect and course correct. The early teething problems and glitches must not convince anyone on how crucial the GST is. It is a leap of faith for the Indian economy. India must be a single unified market and there are no two ways uh, to look at it. Yes, the GST hasn't necessarily been a smooth ride, but no reform of this magnitude can ever be. Indeed, in fact, our effort at ET now is to help the GST evolve, to put forward concerns and to help find solutions. We will play our part in making the not-so-perfect GST a lot better. We will help GST improve the ease of doing business and we will help GST boost India's economic growth. And with that result, we look at GST Reboot in the India Development Debate this evening. I'm Supriya Srinath. With me in Mumbai is my colleague Sandeep Gurumuthi. And joining us on the show is none other than the key architect of the GST, India's Revenue Secretary, Hasmukadia. Along with him, it's a pleasure to welcome Mr. R.C. Bhargav, Chairman Maruti, uh, Ajit Rade of AV Birla Group and Prateek Jain of PwC. Thank you very, very much, gentlemen, for being with us. It really is a special show. 100 days of the GST. Uh, a lot of course correction has been made. Some still needs to be done. But let there be no two ways about it. This is what India must and should stand for. Mr. Adya, can't thank you enough for taking time out this evening and speaking to us. 100 days of the GST, the GSTR 1 deadline ends uh, today. My question to you really is, how satisfied are you uh, with the returns that have been filed on the GSTR 1? Is there any scope of extending the deadline? Are you happy with the levels of compliance just yet? Well, Supriya, uh, to begin with, uh, let me tell you that uh, there needs to be a lot better compliance in terms of filing of return. 
and uh, we will know the exact figure of GSTR 1 by tonight by 12 o'clock. In fact, uh, unlike in case of 3B, where the filing continued beyond the deadline, in case of GSTR 1, it will exactly stop at 12 o'clock tonight because then we have to generate GSTR 2. So, we cannot allow simultaneous generation of GSTR 1 and 2. We will let you know the figure tomorrow, but as of now, we I think till this morning we had got about 40 lakh returns which were filed GSTR 1. Right. And uh, they um, call for okay. actually extending the date. <coughs> right. Uh, Mr. Adia, uh, what explains this slightly disappointing compliance figure? Because, you know, one has to look at this in the context of the fact that registrations have been pretty robust. So, uh, compliance has been pretty weak. Uh, uh, and earlier people were hoping that, pe you know, that this would get done towards the later half of the deadline of, of, of filing returns. Maybe people may pay with the interest and penalty. That hasn't happened. Do you think people are finding ways to evade uh, the, the net? What explains this according to you, sir? Sandeep, we are also trying to understand this and uh, so we have told the state government officers and the central government officers to do a survey of at least 200 people, the non-filers, and get in touch with them, find out what is the reason why they have not filed their return. And we hope to get the result of some such survey very quickly and then we would like to take course correction uh, coming out of this survey. We would like to see what are the reasons why people are not filing their return. And that is what will guide us about the future course of action. Mr. Adhya, you know, there is a concern out there and we've got tax experts like Pratik Jain who will, of course, uh, help us explain that as well. But, you know, one of the concerns is, is there lack of awareness or are you worried that the, the Indian ingenuineness is really out there? Are people breaking up businesses to avoid the tax threshold really? Could that be a concern? Is that a possibility? Well, un well, unless I know the reason for not filing, I don't think I can cast aspersion on the intentions of the people in not filing. Let me find out the reasons for not filing and then we'll be able to give a judgment on that. Let's just get in preliminary comments from our panel this evening. Uh, uh, Dr. Anade, to you first, are you surprised or disappointed with the fact that the compliance has been pretty poor? One was hoping that, uh, you know, uh, that the compliance would be a little uh, more stronger. Dr. Mr. Adia there uh, on, on ET now talking about the compliance figures so far and the deadline expires midnight tonight. Uh, what's your initial reaction? First of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Adia because of the decisions taken in the last GST Council meeting. As you can see, I think uh, the the mood was you know, reflecting that uh, the council is willing to take on issues, address them proactively, and hopefully, you know, this is a roadmap for the future. As far as non-compliance is concerned, as Dr. Adia has said, we need to know the answers. Many of them perhaps feel that they are below the threshold. So unless we actually uh, investigate, there's no point uh, speculating. But Dr. Adia, if I can ask you this question, uh, it's good that uh, there's some relief in terms of quarterly filing from monthly to quarterly. It's good that uh, some of the burden of you know, complexity has been taken off and thresholds have been given. Uh, the question to you, sir, is uh, uh, can we look at further simplifying this process because of the multiple rates and especially, as you know, issues like if an item is 1,000 rupees or less than 1,000 rupees, more than 1,000 rupees, so multiplicity of rates. Or there's an example of where you have uh, some different rates for cashews and uh, maybe almonds and, and raisins and then what do you do with about a packet of mixed nuts or with blended fiber, you know, have cotton and polyester and viscose and acrylic fiber, blended fabric, different rates. So what do you, what rate to apply to a blended, uh, uh, you know, kapra fabric? So going ahead, is there, a, you know, is there a desire to simplify rates, have fewer rates? and, and uh, not have this multiplicity of rates with so many interpretations. And, and you know, I know that the high rates have been kept because of revenue neutrality concerns, but surely if you have simple procedures, fewer rates, uh, less discretion involved, I think the revenue buoyancy uh, may be much more. Uh, what is your feeling about this, uh, simplifying the rates further? No, I agree with you that wherever there are uh, likely to be classification issues. We need to simplify them, we need to uniform, uniformize those rates, and we need to come out with further clarification on that. So that point I agree. 
of course some of the examples uh, which you are giving are of course being talked about but this kind of examples are far and few fabric as far as fabric is concerned of course that is the reason why we have uniformly made it 5% for blended or polyester or cotton it is precisely the reason why we have made it 5% but in nevertheless the basic point that you are making is that there is a need for further rationalization and further simplification further straightening of rates i we do agree that as and when uh, the opportunity comes the council will work on it and the council will take necessary decisions in that direction i think both your supporters and your critics will at least uh, you know grant you the fact that you've been very very keeping your ears close to the ground and responding on the go uh, I'll quickly take a question on compliance because compliance is really the big story of the day and considering the GSTR 1 deadline is ending. Pratik Jain, uh, what's your assessment? Why has compliance been low? I mean, Mr. Adhya is, is right in saying that, you know, states have been asked to do assessment of 200 uh, such people in every group where they're not complying uh, with the GST. What's your own assessment given you the man who understands taxes uh, best amongst us? No, I, I agree with the Revenue Secretary when he says that uh, the reasons are unknown, uh, particularly for GSTR 1, because uh, Form 3B, you can still imagine that, look, so long as you have paid tax, uh, you know, if you have not filed uh, Form 3B, there could be some minor penalties. But if you have not filed your GSTR 1, uh, then your customer does not get the credit, right? So, therefore, this number of 40 lakh out of, let us say, a 60 odd lakh or 65 lakh uh, assessees that we are talking about uh, is, is really low. I think we'll get to know the reasons as as we go along. Uh, of course, one of the reasons was that uh, there were GST and related issues earlier, but uh, last one week or 10 days, uh, I think there is substantial improvement uh, on the GSTN. Uh, maybe there are many small businesses uh, who don't have a turnover, who have taken a registration, but they don't need to file the returns. Perhaps th those are the guys who have not filed the returns, but very difficult to uh, really uh, figure out what are the reason. Uh, maybe we'll get to know once uh, uh, you know the survey, uh, as uh, Dr. Adia is pointing out, is complete. Uh, Mr. Adia, do you think there's a case to sort of now that GSTR two kicks in from tomorrow, which some would say is a slightly more complicated form? Uh, is there a case to look at a summary return uh, process at least in the short term to make it easier for people to file returns? Is that something? I, I know that recommendation has been made uh, in the past as well. Is that something that the government could be willing to consider? Well, uh, the idea of GSTR 1 to 3 is to do perfect matching of invoices. And if we have to do perfect matching of invoices, it is quite inevitable that people who have got B2B transactions, they do report it in GSTR 1 to 3. Probably what we can do is key people who have got only B2C income and those who do not have any other uh, this thing. For them, we could probably think of a simpler return process. In, in, in which instead of three stage thing there is only one uh, stage but there also because the B2C people want to avail of the input tax credit we need to actually give them an opportunity to reflect all the invoices by which they are likely to get input tax credit. I mean one option is key we just uh, do not match all the invoices of people who are claiming input tax credit. In which case it is always possible to make a very simple form and have the return process going on. But the idea of GST is different. The idea of GST is to sort of see to it that there is no loophole anywhere by which people evade their taxes. And if this is the idea then of course we have no option but to go in for a slightly more elaborate system of filing of GSTR 1, 2, 3. Now GSTR 2 is supposed to be auto populated by the system. So, we will see what is the extent of gap that we find tomorrow because when everybody files GSTR 1 for sales invoices, all the purchases side gets uploaded automatically by the computer in GSTR 2 and if there are any missing invoices on the purchase side, then we are giving an opportunity and this time for the first cycle, that is why we are giving them an opportunity of 20 days to figure out how many missing invoices are there on the purchase side in which case the seller has not uploaded them and so the buyer will have to upload them on his own and that is why we have kept a longer period of study and even if suppose there is a problem in the IT system we can do some course correction during these 20 days. 
otherwise as per the normal cycle you get 10 days for gstr1 5 days for gstr2 and 5 days for auto prepared gstr3 so this is why we are uh, keeping a longer period for the first cycle first cycle is going to be a learning cycle for all of us for tax practitioners for tax payers for the government for the gstn everybody is trying to learn out of the first cycle and we will take this experiences forward and if we find that yes it's going to be impossible coping up with this kind of a, a return filing process we council may have to relocate it oh that that's a, that could be a respite to many a years and people are very affable about that and you say the council is willing to rule at this uh, filing system but mr uh, adhya i think uh, ajit ranade has a question exactly on this that yes you've brought in relief for smes that have a turnover of less than 1 and 1/2 crore rupees uh, but invoice matching is a big area of concern and i think uh, dr ranade you have a question on widening the scope further uh, yeah dr adhya of course the great thing about gst is that it widens the tax net and it brings the informal sector into the formal sector and of course it has inbuilt uh, incentives for compliance but you know this real time voucher matching is a unique feature i believe for indian gst system and uh, perhaps uh, not very common at all anywhere else in the world and that creates a complexity and a compliance burden surely uh, because you don't get tax credit unless your uh, input you know in, unless your supplier is also uploaded surely we can do a random audit of a few people rather than doing every b2b transaction has to be you know voucher matching uh, would the council consider this possibility that we should move to a random uh, but a small percentage to a random audit and let let people upload you know don't insist on this uh, every transaction to have voucher matching no i agree with you we need to go through this experience and then make changes if for whatever are required but ajit i beg to differ from you there are many countries in the world which do invoice matching in fact in our own country there are nine states which are asking for invoice wise detail and matching them so it's not something new that we are doing in india there are many countries in the world which are also having a system of invoice creation in the central registry itself so everybody is connected to the net and the moment you create an invoice in your uh, uh, say accounting system it goes into the central server of the tax department and it immediately gets registered now unfortunately in india we cannot try such a centrally central registry of invoices because we are not having internet connectivity everywhere uniformly and that is why we have tried a system in which there is less dependence on internet but at the same time the b2b people at least should be filing all their invoices and uh, that uh, that should not be a very difficult thing to do the only thing what we can think of which the council can think of is depending on this experience instead of monthly matching on invoices it could also be quarterly or it could be even more but this is something with the council will decide only after the first experience of the first cycle matching of invoices something that you're saying the council will look at and that's something that you know people will take heart from of course after the first cycle experiences through mr bhargav i want to get your perspective in as well now company like maruti suzuki probably have not had uh, the kind of gst uh, pangs that some of the small and medium enterprises have had to go through uh, mr bhargav and i know your experience of gst was, has been largely positive uh, but uh, this issue of invoice matching that dr ranade spoke about as well uh, which has disrupted many believe supply chains especially in the retail segment uh, what has maruti's experience been do you see that as an issue uh, for 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 companies in india you know <clears throat> this uh, could become an issue if the buyer does not make the effort of educating his suppliers on how to uh, conform to the gst system what we did in maruti and this process started many months ago because we knew gst was coming and uh, while gst came from july i think we had started doing this work last year and we educated first our tier 1 vendors on all aspects of gst including how to fill the forms how to file the returns then in turn the uh, tier 1 vendors educated the tier 2 vendors we gave support on how the tier 2 vendors were all small industries micro industries on how they should conform to gst because right from the beginning we had decided 
that the entire value chain down the line should conform to the GST so that no input credits were lost to us. The task of educating the uh, suppliers is really in the interest of the buyer. And uh, in most cases where the buyers are uh, fairly big buyers, they have to go down and take, make the effort of educating the suppliers. It's uh, really very, very creditable, I would say, that the government is so responsive and uh, so willing to listen to suggestions and respond in a short period of time that a uh, lot of corrections, a lot of changes have been made. But I still feel that uh, the answer to this compliance business lies essentially in the buyers making the effort of educating their suppliers down the line and ensuring that they put some pressure on their suppliers to make sure that they learn and start complying. The old system of uh, no accounts, no tax returns, nothing, just cannot continue in a modern economy. So I, I think the, the whole system is going in the right direction, but uh, it's not the government alone which has to make the effort. I think all of us who are in business, all right. of us who have, are buyers, and especially the bigger buyers, must make the effort. Fair point indeed. I mean, everybody has to play their part. The bigger buyers will have to perhaps uh, explain it to people down the line, and I don't think there's any denying that. But, uh, Mr. Adia, a quick question on tech preparedness, and you, you, did, uh, you, know, you did bring up a very profound concern. Internet connectivity has been a cause of concern, and which is why we've seen the GST network suffer as well. Uh, the, the concern is that while the GSTR1 deadline ends today, the GSTR2, which is a little more complicated, you know, purchases have to be reconciled to and downloaded and all of that. Uh, how prepared is the system to handle GSTR2? And will you be willing to defer that deadline if the need arises? Well, Supriya, GSTR 2 is not at all complicated. It is auto-populated form, which will be visible to everybody. Uh, and you have to simply do some kind of a reconciling with your purchases. And if you find that there is any entry or purchase which is missing there, because the seller did not upload it in GSTR 1, then you have an option of entering it. Now, this is all that GSTR 2 is for. And I don't think there are going to be many issues in this. And But still, 20 days time is more than enough that we have given for everybody to adjust to GSTR 2 system. And so this is a learning cycle for us and everybody will uh, try to adjust to that. But we will see as we uh, you know, go into these 20 days how it unfolds, what are the problems which people are finding and then we will take course correction uh, in real time. And heartening to hear. Uh, Mr. Pratik Jain has a specific question on deemed exports and I'm going to come to it. It's a slightly technical issue, but it's important to bring it up because, uh, you know, at stake is sort of, you know, potentially giving Philip to infrastructure projects as well. Uh, Mr. Jain, go ahead with your question for Mr. Hasmukadia. Sure. Uh, sir, uh, earlier as you were aware, sir, there were certain projects like power plants, mega power plants, which were entitled for deemed export benefit. So supplies to uh, these projects were not uh, uh, liable to excise duty. Uh, and CST also, because they could issue form C, etc., uh, they could uh, you know, purchase at 2%. Now, under GST, sir, while there is a concept of deemed export which is there, but none of these projects have been notified uh, under that. So in these circumstances that the cost of generation of power, for example, uh, will go up. So just wanted to ask that, is there any thought process as of now of the government uh, to bring back uh, deemed export, which has now in the last GST Council meeting has been decided for exporters uh, to, to uh, bring in for uh, infrastructure projects such as power plants, etc. Look, uh, Pratik, what happens is ki all these uh, exemptions that we give, they create its own inspector Raj. And under the GST system, the fundamental principle is ki as far as possible, we should avoid giving exemptions of any sort. Now, that being the principle, we did not want any exemptions to continue in the post-GST regime. 
but unfortunately because we were not ready with an alternative system of e wallet for the purpose of reducing the problem of working capital blockage for exporters we did decide to go in for an exemption regime for a period of 6 months but that is only with respect to exports not for other things now on one hand all of us want that we should have a very simpler system of taxation in which the tax rate is also very low and there are as few exemptions as possible and on the other hand we keep on getting all this demand not only from indirect tax side but also from direct tax side saying ki please uh, exempt so and so project so and so project now these are two different goals and we cannot have two diametrically go uh, different goals being met so that is a dilemma with us and i don't think we have really thought of about uh, thought about extending any exemptions which were earlier existing you know i mean we we don't plan to extend this kind of exemption regime for many more things this present decision of the 22nd uh, gst council on friday that is in respect of only export related matters fair point indeed uh, i i agree with you that i think exemptions will make the process cumbersome but i will ask you a question sir on excise exempt zones in places like abadi which is in himachal pradesh or uttaranchal and all of that now till now these these units were not paying excise duty earlier and now the government is going to refund about 58% of the central gst component many believe this is hurting the competitiveness of manufacturing in these places what is the thinking within the government on these special zones uh, you know the, the the kinds in badi and other places in uttaranchal the excise exempt zones so yeah supriya we have already taken a decision and uh, the cabinet had decided the dis uh, department of industrial policy and promotion has come out with a notification also now so it is known to them now just uh, day before the uh, government order has been issued the notification notifying the scheme in which we had and this is available uh, i mean this information was available to them right from the first meeting of the gst council in one of its first meeting itself one of the decision taken was that there will be no exemptions area based exemption and in respect of the area based exemption which government of india has given in the first meeting itself somewhere in september 2016 we had said that we will reimburse 58% of the cgst portion on the value added portion which has happened in that state that's all we had discussed and decided and that's what we have notified now so there should be no cause for any surprises for uh, any one of them Mr Bargav you want to comment on that because you have a lot of auto units in these uh, excise exempt zones as well is this a concern at all or like Mr Adya has pointed out there uh, the key concerns raised by industry have been adequately addressed no for for us it's not a concern because uh, we we are really not bothered with this because we don't have many units in the auto export uh, the exempt zones but even if we had it didn't matter because uh, we can always claim uh, drawbacks afterwards and uh, it's not been an issue with us at all okay uh, i i think i i think dr rana day here has a specific question to uh, uh, to uh, to the revenue secretary mr asmuk adya on petrol and diesel the contentious issue uh, on bringing them under the tax net uh, uh, dr rana day go ahead yeah dr adya this uh, you know the excise on petrol and diesel has very much been in the news and as you know uh, pre gst out of 3.6 lakh crores of roughly central excise 1 lakh crore is coming from uh, excise on petro products alone and in addition of course you have state level excise coming from petro products you see the entire petro excise is not under gst so those input tax rates are not available energy costs in india are anyway high and you know by not making them uh, subsumed in gst and not getting the input tax credit we actually are hurting the competitiveness as you know even the coal cess we can understand the cess on uh, sin goods like liquor and so on but coal cess which is of almost 20000 crores uh, nationally today even that is not uh, under gst so don't you think that time has come to subsume these things under gst and uh, you know al also it will also uh, expand the tax net and it will make it much more rational so should we not move on this rather you know as soon as possible
Well, uh, Ajit, while I agree with you the need to have a harmonized GST for all products in India, the issue is that uh, the reform can be done in stages sometime. Even to arrive at a consensus on this constitutional amendment, it took us so many years. And petrol product was also discussed at that time. But the states were uncomfortable bringing petrol immediately into GST. But with great uh, difficulty, they agreed to at least make it a part of uh, constitutional amendment. So there is an enable enablement which has been done now. Any time the council decides, council can bring petroleum into GST. But the fact of the matter is ki we are yet to see the revenue trends emerging clearly and let GST for other products stabilize. And after that, only we can uh, look at this option of subsuming uh, other products into GST. The second thing is ki in order to take care of the cascading effect of GST on the petroleum sector, we have taken a number of decisions and four out of them were taken in the Friday meeting also. Earlier also we had taken a number of decisions and some more decisions were taken in the Friday meeting. In which case the taxation on the inputs which go into petroleum sector, the GST on inputs which go into petroleum sector has been reduced. Now this kind of an effort we are already making and we will try and see to it that the the GST impact does not hurt the petroleum sector too much. But in any case, as you know, petroleum is a uh, highly taxed commodity in any case even today. So little bit of extra cascading of tax they can definitely absorb. Mr. Arya, I will take this question on collections, sir. In, in the months of July and August, we saw collections to the tune of about 90,000 crore rupees plus and minus 3 to 5,000 here and there. Uh, how do you read that number? Because a large part of this was refund and for GST to be viable, there needs to be net collection of nearly 90,000 crore rupees. When, by when do you believe that buoyancy will kick in? Because GST will be a success only when those collections go up. Well, first of all, let me tell you that uh, we will need at least three, four months more to see, uh, to make any sense out of the trend of GST income that we are getting. Because what is happening is that although the amount of cash is coming, the amount that you mentioned every month has been paid in form of cash, but most part of it has come in for a form of IGST also. Now in the third month onward, the flow of IGST should reduce and it should be more converted into CGST and SGST. Plus the first few months, there would be a lot of transition credit of excise and service tax which people would be claiming. And that's why the trend of first few months are no indication for us. So we will have to wait and see how it uh, unfolds uh, into the next few months. But if you ask me when will the real buoyancy come, the real buoyancy will come only when number one, the compliance level improves, number two, when the entire return filing comes into a regular cycle and when we, have a when we are in a position to match GSTR 1, 2 and 3 and then third thing is ki when we have a system of some kind of an e-way bill. Now, these are the three things which are required for us to get a revenue buoyancy. Quick last question to you, uh, Mr. Asma Kadia, which is the big picture. You know, many believe that the slowdown that we saw in the first quarter was GST induced, albeit a temporary slowdown, but was GST induced. Do you think the steps taken by the government in the last council meeting will are enough to fundamentally arrest that slowdown and put the economy back on the path to recovery? Or do you believe more needs to be done uh, for us to move from, you know, calling it goods and services tax to a good and simple tax as the Prime Minister would like it to be? Well, it is a good and simple tax. The glitches which are pointed out are only minor in nature. They are only small, small operational uh, difficulties which people are finding. We are here to solve their problem and we will get over them very soon. But in the meantime, the slowdown which you are talking about happened in the last quarter when GST was not there. It was only because of destocking mainly that uh, uh, and also maybe other reasons where the number was low. 
but we do expect that in the next quarter which is the July to September quarter and the subsequent quarters the growth will be much better. All right, on that note, Mr. Hasmukh Adia, India's Revenue Secretary, taking time out and speaking to us this evening as the GSTR 1 deadline expires. Remember, this is the big milestone. Thank you very, very much, sir, for joining us this evening. We let you go because we've got a quick uh, last round of questions with the rest of our panel. But thank you very much, Mr. Adia, for sparing time and being with us on ET Now. Thanks very much, sir. Okay, let me ask those questions now back to our panel. Uh, Mr. R.C. Bhargav, to you first. Do you think fundamentally the changes taken by the council, the steps taken by the council are enough to address the weak sentiment in the economy? Because, you know, whoever you speak to, it's, it's on account of two reasons. One, GST destocking and of course the demort, lingering effects of demortization as well. Do you think enough has been done on the GST front to address concerns of SMEs, of exporters and of industry at large? I think one needs to go into a little more detail about uh, who has slowed down and why they have slowed down. I don't think we have gone into the root cause of this. Everybody talks of a slowdown, but who has actually slowed down? And are these people who were earlier compliant people who were keeping accounts, who were dealing with the, uh, the tax authorities and having tax returns, who were not doing business with cash only, or were these businesses who were primarily only working with cash? If it is those businesses which were primarily dealing with cash, and I suspect a large part of the slowdown is in those sectors of the economy where it was mostly cash business, then I think there will have to be a slowdown because these, these businesses have to now convert themselves into compliant businesses and learn how to deal with the formal eco economic system of working. They have to deal with the banks, they have to deal with digital payments, they have to deal with keeping accounts, they have to reconcile to paying taxes, they have to reconcile not to taking money out of their businesses, they have to deal with the question of being competitive, uh, not because they are not paying taxes, but because they are being efficient in the manufacturing. So I think this kind of a change had to come sometimes. We couldn't have continued uh, forever with an economic system where a large part of the uh, small scale sector primarily was in that kind of a mode of operation. And whenever that change came, uh, this uh, slowdown effect temporarily had to come. So I think uh, it needs a little bit more analysis, a little more surveys to be done as to who has slowed down and why they have slowed down. It's an interesting point and it's a very contra point to this entire debate and narrative that's going on on the GST. But Ajit Ranadi, you want to come in on that, the point that Mr. Bhargav is making. The question really to ask is who is slowing down and why are they slowing down? Are they slowing down because this is the price you pay for cleaning up an economy that hasn't been so transparent all along? No, Supriya, uh, surely uh, GST is a very big reform and uh, also somewhat disruptive because it's a complete change in system and uh, it, is ex it was expected that there would be teething troubles and it will take time to stabilize. Even the buoyant ta tax revenues that are expected will take some time. But uh, please also note that the slowing down that we are referring to is not just for last quarter, it's been happening for six quarters. You know, if you look at quarterly growth rates, They've been steadily coming down from 9.2 now to 5.7. So there's a structural aspect to it. And the structural aspect is obviously other factors, like, for example, the entire banking system. I mean, the fact of NPAs and the fact that bank credit is, is actually at a multi-decadal low. The fact is that we have excess capacity in certain sectors. The fact is that private sector investment is not as forthcoming as it should in terms of, because balance sheets are deleveraging. So there are many other structural factors. There are cyclical factors, but there are also strong structural factors. So I don't think, and GST has come at a time when those factors are at play. So I, I do believe that there's going to be a turnaround, uh, but we must also acknowledge the, fact, the, 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 stronger, the, the longer term structural factors as well. Indeed, and I think a combination of these factors, like both you and, and Mr. Bhargav pointed out, uh, leading to a clean-up of the economy, this is probably the price that we need to pay, but a price that we shouldn't sort of crib too much about. Uh, Pratik Jain, I'm going to let you have the last word. Uh, you know, before he left, uh, uh, Revenue Secretary Hasmukh Adya insisted that it's already a good and simple tax, uh, you know, uh, uh, which is what the government would like it to believe. What is your own assessment? Is it 
as things stand, a good and simple tax, or do you believe, given uh, the sort of data and the experience that we've seen so far, there's still some distance that needs to be covered before it actually becomes a good and simple tax? So I think there is a consensus that GST is a good tax. I think the overall structural point, which uh, Mr. Ranade also mentioned, uh, I think it will incentivize manufacturing, it will ease the supply chain, it will uh, lead to more competitiveness, and it will uh, uh, create one nation, one tax eventually. Uh, now, that's, that's the optimism uh, or optimist uh, part of it. Uh, is it as simple as we want it to be? No, it is not as simple as it want to be. I mean, you have a multiple rate slabs, you have complicated compliances, you have this uh, proposed e-way bill rules, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's, uh, that's an area when we need to work on. But uh, one thing which I'm, I'm quite encouraged by is this, uh, the way GST Council has, uh, has been functioning. In 22 meetings, all the decision with consensus, in the last meeting, very, very far-reaching uh, decisions on SMEs and uh, exporters and few of the rate changes that, uh, that we have. So I think this is a true example of cooperative federalism. I've never seen all the political parties in this kind of a body uh, taking decision without any voting, despite having a voting right. Uh, so that gives us uh, optimism that we are in the right uh, direction. So is it a, a good and simple tax? Perhaps not as yet, but directionally, I think we are going in the right direction. All right. Okay. On that note, uh, Mr. Prateek Jain, Mr. Ajit Ranade, and Mr. R.C. Bhargav, you know, thank you very, very much. the entire automobile industry is not slow. Sure, please carry on. Please carry on, Mr. Bhargav. Huh? Please carry on, sir. I'm sorry. Please carry on. I was just saying the entire, entire automobile industry has not slowed down. The commercial vehicle industry, which till last year was actually in a slump and going down, has revived in this uh, uh, current financial year and after the GST it's been growing faster than ever before and a commercial vehicle growth heavy and medium commercial vehicles really indicates that people are growing economically they're expecting growth otherwise they would not be buying commercial vehicles I think that itself shows that uh, the GST and the slowing down are not necessarily going together. It's, if there's a slowdown, it's for other factors. Okay. That's a valid point indeed, and I think there are layers within layers of that uh, macro economy. So the slowdown, perhaps, that appears prima facie, uh, you dig a little deeper, is not so rampant. But thank you very much, Mr. R.C. Bharkov, Dr. Jeet Rana Day, and Mr. Prateek Jain for being with us. On this edition of the India Development Debate, we've really put the spotlight on the GST because it is quite clear that the goods and the services tax is a policy that will at best evolve on the go. The government will have to keep its eyes on the ball and ears very close to the ground and respond with utmost agility. Up next, of course, is the second edition of the India Development Debate. This evening, we're going to talk about uh, the Delhi Metro Fair hike. Uh, is this uh, a big victory? for economic thinking over political populism or will politicians have their way? What about uh, the fact that is this going to be a big setback for usage of public transport? We're going to debate all of that and more up next on the India Development Debate.